Hello and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicola Jackson, and I'm here today to bring to you the webinar. And this webinar is brought to you from the Australian College of Nursing and hosted to you by Arjo Huntley Gatingi Group also. So I'm just going to minimise my screen before we start. So if you weren't already aware, today is World Thrombosis Day, which is October the 13th. And today's webinar is called Stop the Clots, Who Should We Protect? So my email is on the bottom of this screen. So if you'd like to contact me at any stage with any additional questions, then please contact me. Um, so for, during this presentation, I'll pose some questions to you and we'll have a live polling session. So we have four questions during this webinar. And then at the end is your opportunity to ask me any questions that you'd like. So while I discuss some of the topics, you can think of some questions that you may um, like me to answer. Okay, so today marks World Thrombosis Day. And the reason today was chosen is because it's Professor Verkow's birthday. Now, I'm going to tell you more about Professor Verkow later on. So he was a scientist that lived last century. Um, so happy birthday, Professor Verkow. And as you may already be aware, it's also Friday the 13th. So I hope you're all having a safe Friday the 13th. Um, there has been some research, but there are actually less road traffic accidents on Friday the 13th compared to other days. So you should be all safe and well. Um, I'm actually catching a flight to Perth after this webinar. So hopefully my plane won't fall out of the sky. Okay, so today's objectives. What is venous thromboembolism or VTE? So we're going to look at uh, patients who are at risk of VTE. We're going to understand the types and uses of prophylaxis. And we're also going to look at the symptoms and management of VTE and explore available resources. So venous thromboembolism, why should we care? Well, VTE is a leading cause of death worldwide. And VTE is the most commonest cause of preventable deaths in hospital. So in the Western world, someone dies every 16 seconds from VTE. The incidents in Australia, in 2008, Access Economics looked at the figures of the deaths and found that 8,253 or 50, 56% of patients Sorry, I'm just minimizing another screen um, just because it's covering my slide. So, so we'll begin again. In 2008, they found that 56% of patients with BTE were due to pulmonary embolism and 44% of these were deep vein thrombosis, which meant that there was about 15,000 deaths per year in Australia of people that acquired VTE. And 43% of these were actually patients of, or people of working age. So the cost to healthcare back in 2008 was over $81 million, which nowadays would be significantly more. So, and there is over 5,000 VTE related deaths. So also from um, Access Economics, um, we can see that VTE actually causes more deaths than all road traffic accidents and falls combined. Also more people die of VTE than bowel or breast cancer. And VTE is also 40 times more deadlier than AIDS and accounts for 7% of all hospital related deaths. Okay, so over to you. So this is your first live polling question. So
So if you look through the answers and answer what is BTE, a term for what type of condition. So, and this is a nice easy one just to check that you're all here for the right webinar. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes just to answer this. So, and I'm expecting a hundred percent of correct answers for this one. So, and I just have to wait a couple of minutes just until the answers come in. So we have either pulmonary hypertension or post thrombotic syndrome, ventricular tachycardia, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, um, or vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Okay, so we should have some answers, so we'll close this poll. Okay, so we have 100% of people saying deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So yes, you are correct, which is a sigh of relief. Otherwise, I would completely lose you by now. So we'll move on to the next slides. Okay, so BTE. So this comprises of, as you correctly answered, both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So, and it is one of the most common and preventable co complications of hospitalization. The rate of hospital acquired BTE is 10 to 40% after general surgery and up to 60% after hip surgery. This table shows you the rates of DVT after surgery, trauma, and in some medical patients in the absence of prophylaxis. So you can see in hip arthroplasty, we have very high numbers. And this is usually due to patients being immobile. Also, the um, deep veins in the pelvic area are often affected. Um, and also you've got an older age group. Um, as well as surgery, which also complicates things. Um, trauma is also high, as well as knee arthroplasty or knee um, replacement surgery. And then moving down, you've also got um, gynecological malignancy. And we know that patients with cancer tend to ha have a higher rate of DVT, especially if they have solid base tumours. So when we look at the venous system and circulation, so you'll see the uh, diagram on the left, which is the veins of the legs. So this comprises of both superficial veins and deep veins. And as you can see, you've got the small saphenous vein. So this is a superficial vein, which empties into the great saphenous vein. So the superficial veins actually have little bridging vessels and they empty into the deep veins. And it's the deep veins that tend to get the big blood clots, which we're more concerned about. So the deep veins are the tibial veins for the below knee, the popliteal vein, the femoral vein, which goes up into the pelvis, and then you get some of the pelvic veins. So just give me one second while I just pause to see. So I'm just gonna stop, stop showing the screen just to make sure that we're running smoothly. So I'll be back in a second. Is there anything I can do? Okay. Um, so 
So I believe the poll is still showing. So, um, so just to give you an update, I think um, what's happened is the, the poll that we did earlier where I asked you to answer some questions, that's actually still showing on the screen. I can't actually see the poll. Um, so you won't be able to see the slides. Um, so somebody just came in to let me know. So the, the people at the ACN are busily working in the background trying to um, take the poll down so that you can see the slides. So, and I believe now the polls come down so you can now see the diagrams. So as I was explaining, you, you um, we have the veins of the lower limbs. So and these are comprise both superficial and deep veins. So the smaller veins, the superficial ones, are the saphenous veins, and then the deep veins are the tibial, which are below knee, the popliteal behind knee, and the femoral vein, which is above the knee going up into the pelvic veins. So when we look at how blood flows through the vein, um, you actually have um, calf muscles, which I'm sure you're aware of. And when the calf muscles contract, that squeezes the veins and helps push the blood back to the heart. In order for that blood to actually go in one direction, you have these valves, which then close off. Now you may see patients with lower limb ulcers and lower leg swelling. Often that can occur because the valves are damaged. So they've lost um, the ability for the blood to flow one way. So they sometimes get a bit of backflow. And you see this often in patients with varicose veins or chronic venous insufficiency. So the blood that flows into those pelvic veins, it then actually goes back to the heart. And by doing this, it goes into the iliac veins, then into the inferior vena cava. There it goes up into the heart via the um, right atrium, and then out into the, um, sorry, I'm getting, confused um, and then it comes out of the pulmonary artery. So when we look at deep vein thrombosis this occurs when a blood clot forms inside a deep vein. So this causes leg swelling and it also causes pain. Also a blood clot can break off and travel to the lungs causing a pulmonary embolism. Post-thrombotic syndrome develops in up to 60% of patients following symptomatic DVT. And post-thrombotic syndrome is where patients get venous leg ulcers, they get very painful, heavy legs. 10% of these patients end up with quite disabling symptoms. And you've probably seen these patients that either come into hospital or you may see them in nursing homes. Um, and these patients often need some form of compression bandaging. <clears throat> and 4% of these patients actually develop quite nasty um, lower leg venous ulcers. When we look at a pulmonary embolism, this is the blockage of the pulmonary artery. So and this is usually caused by the thrombus, which starts off in the calf veins. 90% of PEs are actually caused by a DVT. And silent PEs can develop in between 40 to 50% of individuals with a DVT. There is a 30% mortality rate if PEs are left untreated. And PEs can cause pulmonary infarct and right ventricular failure. They can also cause pulmonary hypertension. 
And we find that 40% of patients with DVT actually have a PE concurrently. So as I was explaining before with the flow of blood, you can see that once a patient has a deep vein, generally deep vein thrombosis, if they're below the knee, these don't tend to break off. It's usually when they get um, significant and when they're above the knee, especially in the femoral or pelvic veins, this is when they become more likely to break off. Once they break off, then the blood clot actually travels through the heart and then exits through the lungs. Once blood clots are in the lungs, they then are trapped and can't go anywhere. There are some instances of patients that can have stroke following a DVT, but this isn't common. And this is generally because they have a hole in the heart. These patients are usually treated in a stroke unit. Um, more likely than not, patients don't have a hole in the heart. So the DVT will cause a pulmonary embolism and not a stroke. Some of the signs and symptoms of a DVT and PE. So if we look at deep vein thrombosis first, pain is often described by my patients as a pulled muscle. Some patients describe this as a cramping pain. Often you'll see swelling, which is usually only on one leg, because you only expect patients to have clots in one leg. Um, if patients have DVTs in both legs, then that's generally as a consequence of something else. And it can, in some instances, be a consequence of malignancy. Patients often complain, or you can actually tell that the affected limb is quite warm. Um, it's red and discoloured. And also you may see some superficial venous dilatation. So you may see some veins that come up to the skin and they're quite dilated, as you can see in the picture. Uh, pulmonary embolism. So this causes dyspnea. So shortness of breath also causes chest pain. You may notice desaturation, tachycardia, a high respiratory rate, and hemoptysis. So hemoptysis is when a patient is coughing up blood. Um, this often happens as quite a late sign and it doesn't happen in a lot of patients. The picture that I've just shown you, this is actually what a pulmonary embolism looks like. So this is a patient that's had the blood clot removed from their lungs by a thrombectomy. And these actually kill people. So from something as insignificant, you may think, as a DVT, patients can actually die. Um, and I've recently had a patient that had a pulmonary embolism. Um, she was discharged home quite well on medication. Unfortunately, her pulmonary embolism got bigger. Um, she arrested in the street. She was brought back into hospital. Luckily, after a lot of resuscitation measures, she survived. Um, and we do see a lot of patients or hear of a lot of patients that die very rapidly from this. And this is why it's important that we do prevent DVTs. So DVTs, as I said, people usually think there's something quite insignificant. But as you can see from this picture, this is a DVT, which extends from ankle up to the pelvic veins. And this is, the clot has been removed via a thrombectomy and it's been laid out on the bandages. So this is actually the clot or blood that's clotted inside the whole vein that's been removed.
Okay, so we'll try this polling question again. So hopefully um, the poll doesn't get stuck. So we'll give this one another go. So this one is probably a bit trickier. So which of the following most increases an individual's risk of BTE, do you think? So there's a few options there. And this just gives me a minute to have a rest and catch my breath. So this is a tricky one and I'll talk you through the answers a little bit. Okay, so if you're ready, then we'll um, we'll close the poll and we'll go to the answers. And uh, we'll see what the most common two answers were. Okay, so now interestingly, the top two, I think we have C and B. Let me just have another look. Okay, so I've got C at 38%. And I think we may have B as well. So the correct answer is actually ischemic stroke. So generally because these patients are... One, they're, they're immobile and also not always, but usually older population. Also having an ischemic stroke, they've had a, generally they've had a clotting event. Um, so this tells you that they're probably at risk of clotting. Um, diabetes, there, if you read some papers, there is a slight increased risk, um, but it's not one of the main risk factors. Knee arthroscopy. So, um, as I've said before, patients, orthopaedic patients that have had hip or knee um, replacements are high risk, but knee arthroscopy, um, I'm probably saying that wrong, so sorry if there's any orthopaedic nurses, um, they're usually day surgery. Now, if they're up and mobile quite soon after surgery, they probably don't need to be on extended prophylaxis and if they're quite fit and well, they're probably not at that much of an increased risk. Um, but that has to really be uh, factored in with other risk factors. So air travel, air travel is quite a tricky one. Air travel in itself isn't actually a high risk. It's usually air travel plus another risk factor. Air travel, is the only thing that's had all the media attention. And all the cases of patients dying of blood clots um, that have traveled overseas, and those cases have been in the media. You won't get the hospital cases in the media unless, unless there's some kind of, um, what do you call it? Some kind of law event. Um, if a patient or family have sued a doctor, then you'll hear about that in the media. Otherwise, you're not going to hear about the hospital acquired BTEs or deaths. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to just talk about this Professor Burkow character for a minute. Because um, it is important because... Without Professor Verkow, we wouldn't have known about clotting and risk factors, and then we wouldn't have developed things to prevent clotting. So Rudolf Ludwig Karl Verkow, so he was actually seen as the founding father of pathology and social medicine. 
Um, he was born in Poland back in 1821, died in Prussia in 1902. He was a German physician, an anthropologist, a pathologist, a prehistorian, a biologist, writer, editor, and politician. And he, in his lifetime, I think he wrote something ridiculous, like 2,000 um, journal articles. Um, and as you can see in the picture, he's about to be drowned by all his journal articles. So he was quite a prolific um, researcher, scientist. So, and you probably are not aware that he was behind all of these different terminologies. So he was the person that came up with food hygiene theory. Um, he also had a lot to do with um, early autopsy, um, the science behind autopsy. Um, he discovered leukemia um, and other things. And he was actually one of the pioneers in th forensics. But what we want to talk about today is Birkow's triad, which you may or may not have heard about, but this is really important. And it's something that you really should try and remember, particularly when you're assessing patients. Okay, so what is Birkow's triad? Well, Birkow came up with a theory, so, and, Clotting involves three factors. So the first factor we're going to talk about is hypercoagulability. So, and this is where blood is thicker or stickier. Cancer can cause this, inflammatory bowel disease, estrogen use, thrombophilia, or genetic or predisposition to clotting sepsis and dehydration. Endothelial injury, so when there's damage to the inside of a vessel, often that exposes collagen and platelets love to stick to collagen. So this often causes the clotting to take place. And so here you've got things like surgery, prior history of VTE, venous access, vasculitis, and trauma, and of course, surgery is a big one. And the last thing which we have all heard about is venous stasis, so immobility, age, heart and lung disease, obesity, stroke, and spinal cord injury all fit into this. Now, we're gonna look at a case study, and I've actually used Professor Birkow as his own case study. So Professor Birkow actually died when he was 80 years old. Um, and for this case study, I don't know if he had any past medical history, but we'll say that he didn't have any. He was very fit and healthy, especially with all those different jobs. And he actually died falling off a, a tram. But what we'll say in this day and age, he sustained a hip fracture after falling from a bus. So I'd just like you to think about that and think about um, Verkau's triad. So what would Professor Verkau's risk factors be? So if you remember, we've got venous stasis. So we've got an 80 year old man with a fractured hip. We've got hypercoagulability. And we've also got endothelial injury or trauma. So hopefully you've managed to come up with a few risk factors. So we'll have a look now collectively. Okay, so some of the risk factors I can think of would be the obvious one would be trauma. Um, because he has a fractured hip and given that he's 80 years old. Immobility. Um, I'm taking some poetic license. I'm going to say that he's probably dehydrated. Um, 
he's 80 years old, so that puts him in a higher risk group. Um, and also he's probably at risk, uh, particularly as he died in 1902, he's probably at risk of infection. So I'm going to put sepsis down as a risk factor too. But you may have come up with other ones. So when we look at the cow's triad, we can actually fit all of these risk factors into the cow's triad. This actually helps us to decide if our patients are high risk. So Professor Verkow is actually high risk of developing a blood clot. So now let's get you thinking a bit more and question three. So we're back to another poll. Um, and again, this is a tricky one. This is really for those of you that know the guidelines or if you were listening to last year's webinar, you may uh, have remembered the question or the answers. So there are a number of very high risk patient groups. And some of those patients actually should be going home on extended prophylaxis. And when we say extended prophylaxis, we don't just mean stockings, we mean chemical as well. So out of these patients, which ones should go home on chemical prophylaxis? So which patients should we be teaching to give their own injections? Okay, so I think we'll close there just because I'm looking at the time and we've got a bit more to get through. So hopefully a lot of you have had time to answer. So we'll just wait a second to get some results. Okay, so we're, we've got quite an evenly spread out results. Now I've thrown you off because the majority, 31% said ischemic stroke. So although ischemic stroke is a higher risk group, they're actually also at risk of developing bleeding in the brain. Um, so these patients generally, um, once their bleeding risk has settled, Yes, they do need extended chemical, but it's not, it's usually um, therapeutic, not prophylaxis. And that's not VT related, that's for something else. So major surgery, 28%. So these patients may need extended if there's other risk factors involved. Um, but not generally. Um, the answer I was looking for, which only got 24%, was major abdominal cancer surgery. So these patients need to go home on 28 days of chemical prophylaxis. So they should be going home on at least four weeks. That's because they have cancer. Um, with the abdominal surgery, often there's some manipulation of the pelvic veins, which increases the risk further. Another patient group which needs extended prophylaxis are orthopaedic patients, especially hip and knee arthroplasty, and they often need to go home on five weeks of extended prophylaxis. So, and we know that this doesn't always happen in practice, um, but if you look at the guidelines, major abdominal cancer surgery and orthopedic surgery are the two main ones that need to go home on quite a few weeks of prophylaxis. Okay, so moving along. When we look at prevention, um, 
so of blood clots. There's two types of thromboprophylaxis, chemical, which doesn't dissolve blood clots, it just prevents the formation of being thrombus. And it also prevents extension by altering the process of blood coagulation. We also have mechanical prophylaxis, which increases blood flow velocity in the leg veins. So the recommended prophylaxis in surgical patients, so this may differ slightly depending on where you work. Generally hip and um, hip fracture surgery is five weeks, knee is two weeks. And then we go down further. And as I was saying before, abdominal cancer surgery, generally 28 days. Um, and then the other surgical patients is anywhere from five to 10 days. Um, or if the patient needs to be um, in hospital longer, then they should, be, they should remain on chemical prophylaxis for longer. In medical patients, um, so a lot of people think surgical patients are only at risk. Um, medical patients are just uh, at just as much risk as medical patients. Um, ischemic stroke patients, once their bleeding risk has subsided, they should be on 40 milligrams of anoxaparin or unfractionated heparin. They should also be on intermittent pneumatic compression. Um, following some studies, they are now not recommending graduated compression stockings in stroke patients. Um, myocardial infarction should have chemical, general medical, and definitely cancer patients, and the duration until discharge. There are lots of resources. Um, one of the, um, a good place to go if you want further information is the CEC, um, and they have a website which is on there. There's a lot of resources from the CEC, uh, the Clinical Excellence Commission for New South Wales. On They've got guidelines on um, BTE, anticoagulation, uh, they've got education, patient materials. So I would really strongly advise that you check out the CEC uh, website. Now there isn't many guidelines around. Uh, the last international guidelines were published in 2012. Uh, the last Australian guidelines were published around 2010. Um, so, and this is something that your facility may use or you may have your own um, guidelines, but they probably would be based on the ANZ Working Party guidelines. Um, so after this webinar, I would um, advise that you find what guidelines you use in your facility or you have a look at um, guidelines in use in Australia, um, just so you know what patients should be receiving. When we look at chemical prophylaxis, there are different types. So we have injections and there are two main types of injections. These are low molecular weight heparin, and you may have heard of anoxaparin. This is generally a daily injection for patients, um, unless um, they're on treatment, but for prevention, it's daily. If they've got renal impairment, so if they've got a creatinine clearance less than 30, or GFR is a guide, then that can generally be half to 20 milligrams. Unfractionated heparin, this can actually be used in patients with renal impairment, but the only issue here is it's generally given as a twice or three times daily injection because there, it is a short, um, it has got a shorter half-life. <clears throat> there are newer drugs out now, 
Um, so you may have heard of Rivroxaban, Zeralto, um, Apixaban or Eliquis, and Dipigatran, also known as Prodexa. These can also be used, but only in hip and knee surgery at this point. And also, um, there is um, difficulty in using these drugs in patients with renal impairment. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just, oh, I'll just go back one. When we look at the coagulation cascade, um, you can actually see from this diagram where all these uh, blood thinning drugs. Sorry, I think you lost my audio for a second. Um, you can see from the clotting cascade where all these drugs actually affect all the factors. So, we don't use warfarin, some hospitals do. Warfarin, we don't use as um, prophylaxis at my facility, generally because it's um, quite difficult to use and maintain, and it does take quite a long time to get the right levels. Um, but you do need to go back and refer to your own local guidelines to what you do use. When patients are on blood thinners, or if the medical teams are deciding to put the patients on blood thinners for prophylaxis or even for treatment, there are various things that need to be um, thought about. So patients with significant renal impairment, uh, patients with active bleeding, um, especially if they've got um, chronic bleeding issues as well, um, any platelet disorder. So patients really should have platelets greater than 50. Um, and if patients are on blood thinners and their platelets are dropping significantly, this is something that needs to be alerted with the medical teams because this can be quite significant. So when you have a patient on blood thinners, you should assess for bleeding. You need to check the patient's platelet count. And as I was saying, if the patient's platelets drop, um, and particularly if they drop between 30 to 50% in 24 hours, this could actually ind indicate an interaction. Um, and we call that heparin injuries thrombocytopenia. Um, renal function needs to be monitored. Hemoglobin, and also don't forget about the injection sites. Um, so patients can develop not skin nodules, so hard lumps, infection, lesions. Um, so skin injection sites also need to be monitored. Okay, so last question for you guys. So we'll open the poll once again. And I keep jumping. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm not here. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'll get counseled when I'll be counseled. Okay, so now before we move on to mechanical prophylaxis, this is just a question to test your knowledge. Um, and it's just mainly for more my interest um, in because graduated compression stockings are something where I generally get varied answers to when it comes to contraindication. And I don't think many people actually are aware of the main contraindications. Okay, so we'll close the poll and we'll go to the answers. So what do you think are the contraindications of graduated compression stockings? A, previous history of BT, so that's fine. But yeah, they can wear graduated stocking. And we want people uh, with BT to wear stockings. 5% uh, varicose veins, good. People with varicose veins probably need stockings. Yay, 77% of people said peripheral arterial disease. So you're actually, you're really on track there. Um, this is how I wanted you to answer because 
There has been known complications around um, over the last few years of people not checking patients to see if they've got peripheral arterial disease and then patients ending up with ischemic limbs, etc. So if you're not sure, just check for a pedal pulse, so check for a pulse in the patient's feet. Um, if they've got a pulse then, and they've got good skin, um, so they're not, they haven't got frail, fragile skin, then you're generally safe to put compression stockings on. Um, if you're not sure, check with your vascular nurse specialist or doctor or somebody with more experience. Okay, good. I'm very impressed. So how do graduation graduated compression stockings work? Well, these actually provide circumferential graduated compression, which um, increases blood flow velocity and um, promotes the venous return. They also prevent um, endothelial tears. So you know, once patients develop um, venous stasis, they tend to get swollen veins. Those veins tear inside, and then that's where the clots can actually um, stem from. So the recommendations are that all stockings should follow the Siegel pressure profiles. And stockings should be used on patients with prolonged periods of immobility. And really, we should be checking patient skin regularly. So I've found the odd patient with pressure injuries not caused by the stocking, but gone undetected because um, patients aren't having regular skin inspections. Um, also, patients that have the wrong size on can end up with indentations and various things like that. Um, there are stockings now that come in different colours. Um, so historically, they've always been white, um, but there are now some different coloured ones on the market. So some of the contraindications, so severe edema, um, allergy, um, heel pressure ulcers, uh, leg deformity, peripheral arterial disease and stroke patients. So we need to look at intermittent pneumatic compression. So these work by using inflatable garments which are either single chamber or multi-chamber. And these work by emptying veins and increasing blood flow velocity. There are two different types of intermittent pneumatic compression that either deliver uniform or sequential. They're safe and effective, and they also can be an alternative to anticoagulant therapy to prevent DVT. And mechanical prophylaxis, especially IPC, is generally what we use for patients that can't have blood thinners. So trauma patients should have them on. And patients, all surgical patients should have them on, even if they're on blood thinners, and because we know that with, in combination with blood thinners, we actually have better outcomes. Um, intermittent pneumatic compression also helps to prevent lower limb edema and also associated complications of immobile patients. So intermittent pneumatic compression actually mimics a natural activity of calf muscle by increasing the blood flow velocity as said before and also decreases venous hypertension by, and also flushes valve pockets. These apply a shear strain on the endothelial lining of the vein and artery, which releases biochemical mediators. And we know that calf compressors actually enhance fibrinolysis. So when small clots form, they'll actually help them break the clots down and the body will reabsorb them before they become a huge issue. Um, they also enhance platelet disaggregation, so they stop platelets from clumping together. And they also enhance vasodilatation. 
IBC also decreases the risk of DVT by 60%. So when we look at Verkar's triad, IPC actually addresses all three aspects of Verkar's triad. And as you can see, external compression pushes blood from superficial veins into the deep veins. It also reduces the venous distension and reducing the risk of those little tears to the vessels and also increases blood flow, which enhances um, fibrinolysis, which in itself prevents the blood from becoming stick and thicky and thick, sorry. So the last international guidelines recommend that um, calf compression should be worn for at least 75% of the time. A time log functionality should be um, incorporated into the machine um, to monitor compliance. They should all be battery powered um, because this will obviously increase the time it can be used on the patient. And really when you look at um, what machine to use, you have to look at patient compliance and comfort and also nursing intervention. And these are all things that will make um, the product successful. So these are some other contraindications, precautions which you may be aware of, cardiac failure. That's a difficult one. Um, some patients with mild cardiac failure can actually tolerate compression. Um, so just check with the doctors first. Okay, so let's go back to Professor Verkow. And Professor Verkow went to theatre um, and underwent insertion of a dynamic hip screw. And he's now day one post-op. So he has an EGFR of 65. So that's his renal function. So we would expect it to be anywhere above 30. Um, platelets are 256 and HB 106. So what would his recommended prophylaxis regime be? Well, I take a glass of water. Okay, so, and what duration would you think he should be on? So should he be on prophylaxis only during his hospital stay or would you expect him to be on extended prophylaxis? Now, the guidelines say that he should be on anoxaparin 40 milligrams or if your hospital uses daltiparin, he can be on that too, a daily dose. Um, he should also have graduated compression stockings and intermittent pneumatic compression. For, so this is for hip fracture surgery. And duration of prophylaxis. So again, he's orthopedic. This is a hip operation. Um, and Yes, what I should have said is the most important thing as part of someone's prophylaxis regime is early ambulation and hydration. So and these are some simple measures you can use. So duration. So in the guidelines, we know for hip fracture surgery, the um, duration is 35 days. Okay, if we look at investigations for VTE, um, so for deep vein thrombosis, generally patients have an ultrasound. Once they've had a, so if we go back one step, patients will come into ED complaining of either leg pain or chest pain, shortness of breath. So generally we do a, a D-dimer and this is, shows you, it's a blood test. And if it's raised, if it's above 0.5, then we know that there's some kind of inflammation or um, clotting gone on somewhere. If it's less than 0.5, we can actually rule out a blood clot there and then. So if it's more than 0.5 and the doctors are suspicious that the patient has a D 
DVT, they'll then go for an ultrasound. If they're suspicious of a pulmonary embolism, the patients will then go for either a CTPA or a BQ. Um, it's also important that the patient has an ECG. Um, this is usually done before the scan, and we may see some changes on ECG, which the doctors, it may help with the doctors in diagnosing or leading to doing further tests. Um, when a patient's had a confirmed PE diagnosis, then we generally do a TTE, a thoracic echo, and this will tell us if there's some right heart strain involved. Not everyone will have right heart strain, um, and the majority of patients nowadays um, are treated in the ED department and go home within a few hours. So when we look at treatment, so treatment's slightly different to prophylaxis. The doses are a lot higher, and generally it's weight-based. Um, duration also depends on the blood clot. Sorry, I'm scrolling through again. Um, so it depends whether it's provoked, unprovoked. Um, you may have seen patients that have an IVC filter. Um, sorry, my filter's moved. Um, so the IVC filter... Generally, these only get put in for patients that can't be on blood thinners. And remember, blood thinners only stop new clots from forming. They don't dissolve clots. We can do thrombolysis, um, and we usually use alteplase or urokinase. And this will dissolve blood clots, but it can actually cause quite bad side effects. Um, so we can, that can actually cause catastrophic bleeding um, if it's used um, either on the wrong patient or if the patient has something going on that the doctors aren't aware of. And we only really use thrombolysis as a last resort or when it's life-threatening or it's going to affect the patient's quality of life. So the last slide, and then you can actually start typing some questions to me, um, and hopefully we'll have five or 10 minutes at the end so I can answer some of your questions. So just to sum up everything while you're typing away, um, DVT and PE constitute major health problems. Um, DVT and PE can be significantly reduced by prophylactic regimens, which should be used more extensively. Prophylactic therapy should be tailored to the patient's disease and degree of risk. And in some groups of patients, more than one effective prophylactic regimen is available and should be used. And remember, prevention is key. Effective prophylaxis reduces BT incidence by 60 to 90%. So if you're interested in more information, um, there's a few links up here, which I'll leave on the screen um, while I answer some questions. So please look at the CEC and, of course, the ACN, Australian College of Nursing website. Um, also, because it is World Thrombosis Day, there is an international website connected with World Thrombosis Day um, where you can also find a lot of international uh, patient stories. Um, there's also events going on all around the world today. So you can look at worldthrombosisday.org to find out what's going on in the world. Okay, so let's see what questions you have for me. So should I be scared? Okay, there is a question, but I can't read it. So just give me a second. I might need that question retyping because my screen, hang on. What about if 
sorry, but it doesn't quite make sense to me. Now we'll have to move on because that question, I'm not quite understanding, sorry. If, it, if I work out what that question means, I'll come back to it. Or somebody can come in and explain. Any more questions? Are we gone quiet? Okay, so I think we're having technical difficulties right now. Um, it's probably getting nearer people's home time, so they're probably dropping off. Um, so I'll just stay for a couple of minutes and see if any other questions come through. So you can email me. I'm happy for you to email me at Nicola dot jackson at s b h a dot org dot a u so if you have any additional questions you can email me directly and i'll try and answer them so no there's nothing coming through i'll just see if people drop out um I think people are beginning to drop out. So if we'll, if more people drop out, I think we'll finish um, without the questions. <clears throat> okay, you're all dropping like flies now. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Um, so thank you for listening to me. And Hope you learn something. Um, and I just want to thank the ACN and um, also Ardra Huntley for supporting this event, because it is important that we get the word out there. Um, and um, consider becoming a member of the ACN. And maybe I'll meet you around the trap sometime. So have a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so goodbye. Okay, bye.